Okay, this is going to be a pretty brief video, but I want to go over what we're calling sort of the vendor requirements. And again, we can use that term pretty loosely, but let's say you're a vendor and you want to convert your library to the universal category system and you want to advertise it as such. Then this video is going to discuss what it is that you need to do to do that. Just want to point out again, everything we're doing is voluntary. The category list is available for anybody to use, whether or not they call themselves UCS compliant, whether they don't want to use our logo, any of these things. Uh, go ahead, use it as you feel fit. But if you'd like to advertise your library as UCS compliant, there are a few steps that we sort of ask, and they're quite minimal actually. So I just want to go through them here and discuss what it means to have a UCS compliant library. So you're a vendor and you're just starting out. I would recommend that you go through all the tutorial videos um, that are up on our YouTube channel, and you can get to that here on our homepage, universalcategorysystem.com. You can start here with this introduction. This will explain the whole, all the components of the system. I'm also going to finish, hopefully today, a much more elaborate tutorial on how to use SoundMiner, at least, to convert libraries into the UCS system, how to build file names, how to assign categories, all of these things. So that'll be an entirely additional playlist that you can look for. It should be up, hopefully, by tomorrow. But for now, uh, go through these videos on YouTube, of which this is one. So if you're seeing this, you're already there. And then there are really only three sort of rules or requirements that we're sort of asking for to call yourself a UCS compliant library. The first, and we're going to go here to the Google Drive, is that for every sound in your library that you're going to sell as a vendor, you're going to publish, to call it UCS compliant, basically every sound in your library needs to be assigned to one of these categories. Let me zoom in a little bit. Um, and one of these categories only. So you're not allowed to make your own categories. You're not allowed to change the name of this category ID. This is very crucial that this stay the same. And the reason for that is that all these different programs are going to use this system expect to see that category ID exactly as it's written. If you change the name of it, it's not going to be able to match in some kind of a lookup table and fill in different pieces of metadata. So this is really crucial. So, so those are the really the first two pieces right there, This that you pick a category from our list for your sound, and that you assign it this category ID. That category ID needs to go at the head of the file name. That's really the only, the third piece. That's it. The reason for that, again, is that various programs that are going to use this system will expect to see it there. And by seeing it there, they're going to be able to pull that information out. They're going to be able to fill in metadata fields, build metadata fields, all these different things. So you want to assign your library to our system. You come here, you pick a category, you don't change it, you don't change the name, and you prepend the category ID with an underscore at the very beginning of your file name. That's literally all you'd have to do. At that point, it's completely okay to advertise this library as a UCS compliant library. It's really this category system that's at the heart of this and not the file name structure. We would encourage you to explore the file name structure videos to consider using the file name structure for the reasons we're outlining there, but that's absolutely not a requirement. And you don't have to change anything else in your file name if you really feel strongly about it. Now, if you don't want to prepend the category ID to the beginning, but you want to use the category system and put that into metadata, you're absolutely free to use so. We just ask that you don't advertise the library as a UCS compliant library um, and you don't use the logo in your artwork. And the reason for that is simply that we feel strongly that the presence of this category ID at the beginning of the file name is a super crucial part of what we're trying to do. We expect all these programs to be able to find it there, to be able to script it out, to assign it to different metadata fields. And if it's not there, then it's just not part of what we're trying to do. Uh, again, use the category system if you want. It was, certainly, it's still useful if everybody would adopt the categories, even if they're not willing to put the category ID at the beginning of the file name. Then we would ask that if you are going to advertise this as a UCS compliant library, that you'd consider going to our uh, release folder to the logos and finding in different styles, say here's some PNG versions, that you incorporate this logo somewhere in your artwork. It doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be flashy. You can change the color if you wanted. You could you know, make it somewhat transparent. Our hope is that just by including it somewhere in the artwork that customers, again, will be aware that you've taken the time to assign your sounds to one of these categories. If, they're, if they want to adopt this system for their library, then they're, they know that this library they're going to purchase from you is going to basically have that much work at least done, that it's going to be assigned to a category and that the category ID is going to be at the beginning of the, beginning of the file name. And that's it. We are trying to keep some standardization to it, however, and so that a user who downloads something that claims to be UCS compliant can expect certain things. And that's really all there is to it. The logo is available in different formats, SVG, PNG, EPS. 
again, you can creatively incorporate this into your artwork in any sort of way that you decide. Um, and then that's it. You have now a UCS compliant library. Again, I would encourage you to explore this idea of the file name structure that we've come up with to take the time to understand at least why we're lobbying for it. And if nothing else, if you don't want to adopt the rigidity of our standard, then at least understand the thoughts behind it and think a little bit in your file names of your library to include certain pieces of metadata that, that a user could actually then strip out and assign to different places and at least to think about a logical and useful file name, even if you don't uh, want to use ours. But again, we would encourage you to explore the two videos on file names, understand what it is that we're doing and why. There's one other thing you might want to do if you're a vendor, and that is to come here to our uh, release again. And let's go into the vendor category. And what you'll see are two spreadsheets. One's a blank version of the other one, but if we look at this one called the UCS Vendor Master List, what you'll see are a list of vendors that are interested and signed up so far. There's actually quite a few more that just haven't come to do this step yet. Um, and we ask you to fill in or to send us these six pieces of information. So. What's the name of your company? Would we'll go here under vendor. Pick an abbreviation for your company. And the reason for that is that in the file name itself, rather than using full vendor names, we're encouraging the use of these abbreviations. By assigning yourself an abbreviation that you agree to sort of use in the file names if you're going to use them, then what it will allow is that any company could come and take a copy of this sort of list and use it as a lookup table. So anytime they see T-Rex in the vendor position or the creator ID, what we call that part of the file name, the program could basically go, oh, T-Rex is Thomas Rex Beverly. And in the designer field or the manufacturer, wherever the user chooses to put it, they could put out the expanded words Thomas Rex Beverly. So it's a way to keep the file name short, but also still send the vendor information as part of the file name. That's really the main goal of this list and what we're trying to do. But to keep track, just because I'm curious and it's fun to see, put the country that you're operating out of just to see where people are. Um, whoever your contact person for your company is, if it's not the same as your vendor name, for you know, if you have a company name, but put your name here. Put an email, a contact email for you as a vendor in case a user wanted to reach out something relating to your library, and a home page for your, for your libraries or for your vendor. So down below, we've started an experiment of sort of keeping track of uh, a handful. There's quite a few more than this, but um, of libraries that are sort of compliant and different things. You can pretty much ignore this for now. I don't know how we'll use this or if we will or what the plan is for this. This is just a proof of concept of a way that a vendor could come in here and sort of list their libraries, give direct links to the libraries, uh, sort of give it a general library type and assign a unique number if they wanted to. Again, this is more for some behind the scenes housekeeping that we were exploring. Uh, we're not really using this right now, so you don't need to supply us any of that. But what you can do is go back to the Google Drive vendor folder and come to this one that says USC Vendor. The name is slightly different because I changed it mistakenly. Change this back. Call this a submission form. And you'll see here that it's here's prompting you for these pieces of information. So what you can do is just come down to the bottom here, right click and say duplicate. And basically now come in here, rename it, and put your name. And then come in and fill your pieces of information. So if I was going to fill it all for me, vendor name is just my name. Uh, vendor abbreviation, I'm going to say I want to use TNFX. Now here under the abbreviation, we're asking you not to use uh, two-letter abbreviations. They're too similar to initials, and a lot of designers and people of, in their personal libraries are going to use their initials or initials of colleagues and friends. So we're asking you to try and come up with something three or four characters long that's somewhat unique. I would also avoid using words that would actually be readable as a word. For example, one issue that we know happens is boom. If we were to type in boom for the vendor abbreviation, well, that's great. But now every time you search for the keyword boom, if you're also searching vendors or categories or uh, designers slash manufacturers in your library, now every boom sound is going to come up every time you search the word boom. So one solution would be to use zeros instead for something like that. That's what Fox Audio did, F0x instead of FOX, so that every time somebody were searches the word Fox, they don't pull up every sound in, from that vendor. So... Um, and I would again say, you know, don't use something like um, that for sound morph, right? It's too short. Anybody who has the initials SM might get confused in their own library. But what you could do is something like this, right? S morph or something. I don't know. Sound morph hasn't chosen an abbreviation yet, but we would encourage them to do something like that. 
Uh, so in my case, I'm going to use TN effects for Tim Nielsen effects. And I'm in the United States, and the contact person is me. So I'm going to just type that in here. And the email link I'm going to put universal category system at gmail.com. And the website is I'm just going to put here for now. I don't have my own vendor website up right now. So I'll just put that. And then I'll notice that you've come in here and you've done that. You've duplicated the sheet to add your own things. And um, I'll merge it over into the other document. Or you could just email me or you find me in the Slack channel and send me this information as well. And I'll make sure that it gets merged over. Again, it's a way for you as a vendor to designate this abbreviation. That's the main goal of this. And it'll be a pretty useful thing for users to be able to sort of use an abbreviated version of your vendor name or the full name back and forth in creating file names and parsing out file names and things like that. So that's one thing you might want to consider doing. It's certainly not a requirement, but um, as this list grows and grows of, of vendors using UCS and things, it'll be nice to be able to keep track of them and keep track of a contact person and stuff just even for us. So we'd ask you to consider coming in and submitting this information somehow. Again, you could just send it to me as a message in the Slack channel as well, just as easily. So that's really just about it for the vendor requirements. It's not particularly complicated. Um, feel free to join us over on the Slack channel. There's a whole vendor category or a vendor uh, channel, I should say. And uh, there's one that says, I think, vendor help and vendor announcements. So if you had a library that you wanted to announce as being compliant or you know, in the system, you could announce it there. Feel free to ask us questions. Um, as a vendor, if you're trying to struggling with figuring out what category you should use for something. There's plenty of places and channels over on the Slack channel to ask for help. Say, you know, I don't know what category should these sounds be in. There's a lot of people over there that can help. Um, if you're using SoundMiner, there's some of us that will be more than willing to help write a workflow to convert your library. You'll see in this other tutorial I'm about to release this weekend as well, a pretty elaborate video on how to sort of take a set of libraries and convert them into this system if you wanted to. And some of the cool tools that are available to help you in SoundMiner to do that. And building these workflows is something that some of us can do fairly quickly, and we'd be more than willing to help you with that if that's something that you're struggling with. So that's it. If you're a vendor and you're interested in using the system, that's sort of requirements, loosely termed. And if you have any questions, find us over on the Slack channel and ask for help. We're here to help.